Good morning, church. Summon our Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're grateful that you worship Jesus, and we're uh, very encouraged that you're going to choose to worship him with us this morning. My name is Mark. Uh, I have the privilege of being one of the ministers here, and we're in this lengthy series through the Gospels, and uh, as we open our series this morning, I want to ask you a question. It's a threatening question, because the question itself may cause you to be uncomfortable, and the answer may cause you to be more uncomfortable. And here's the question of the morning. Have you ever been offended by God? Has God ever offended you and caused you to wonder about whether or not he knows what he's doing or whether he should be doing what he's doing? You see, the gospel is offensive, and Jesus even said it would be a stumbling block. It would cause people to, instead of running to him, would cause many people to stop and turn away. See, the gospel's message is offensive, especially to Americans. It's offensive because it says every single one of us has sinned, and every single one of us not only has sinned, but we are sinners in our core. And the second thing it brings up is that we need rescuing and we can't rescue ourselves, which offends the fire out of Americans because we always take care of ourselves. I'll, I, I'll ask for help. I don't need help. And the third thing that makes it offensive is that it claims there's only one way to receive the rescuing. And then we say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. You have no right, preacher, to tell me I'm, I'm not right. You have no right to tell me I can't fix my own problems. And you have no right to tell me there's only one way to heaven. And... You may not think I have a right, but the gospel does. And the words of Jesus are crystal clear on this. The gospel is offensive because it takes down our hierarchy and it puts Jesus at the top. And instead of our kingdom being built and our reign increasing, we actually lower ourselves to submitting ourselves to a greater king and trusting him through all of it. So the offensive truth of scripture is that God will always do what is best he won't always do what we want. And is it, was, is it possible to be offended by God? Jesus, he thought so, and he talked about it. In fact, he would paint these stories, or we call them parables, these stories that he would create that would give us a vision of who God really is compared to what we thought he was. And when he corrects our understanding, he's pointing out that we need his help to understand who God is and what the gospel is. When Jesus would say, the kingdom of heaven is like, he would begin to tell a story. He told a story about a lost lamb and a woman who lost a coin and a father who lost two sons, one who moved away and one who stayed right there. And Jesus cast the vision of a God who pursues us with love. He told a parable of a dead poor man and a dead rich man, and he cast the vision that what we choose to do here in this lifetime matters in eternity. It carries over the choices we make. Then he told a parable of a persistent woman and an unrighteous judge and he let us know of a God we don't have to beg to help us. He wants to help us and he's willing to help us if we'll ask. Today he gives us another kingdom vision and it's rather offensive. Let's read Matthew 20 verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you go also and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found some still standing around, and he asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. And he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired, and go on to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. So when they came, those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give to the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. That's offensive. And you think, no, no, I can't admit that it's offensive. No, you're American. Tell the truth. <laughs> it's offensive. There's no union in the world going to allow this. Oh, there we are. Because you think, well, spiritually, I separate all that. No, no, Jesus is actually using metaphors. Listen to some of the metaphors he's used in the hundred weeks that we've been studying through the story of Jesus. 
He's used these metaphors like party, feast, wedding, and now work. Work matters. You see, work isn't a punishment. Work actually existed before Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. They were caring for the garden and working in God's kingdom before they were punished. Work is a gift. Work is what we're created to do. Now, some of us have gone way too far. We won't even rest because we're controlling the universe. No, you're not. So I got to take a day off, take a day of resting in me and remind yourself when you don't have control of it, I always do. It's called the Sabbath. But work is a blessing. Work is a promise of fulfillment. We, we all want to do something creative. Whether we're paid or not, we're contributing to something that matters. So Jesus used work as a metaphor for his kingdom. And to the Jews, work was a virtue. It displayed who they worked for and why they did what they did. There's some points of background I want to give before I get right into the heartbeat of what I think Jesus is saying to us and why we might find it offensive. The first is a, a denarius is a day's wage. That was the term of how they paid back then. So you didn't have checking accounts, you didn't have savings funds, you didn't have welfare. So if you didn't work, you didn't eat. And so they would work for a day and they would be paid at the end of the day and that money would be used the next morning at the market to buy food for that day. So they might be able to save some, but they couldn't go lengthy periods of time without working. And a denarius was a day's wage. So I just did some calculations. Let's say someone makes starting out, and they make $36,000 a year as their annual income, and they work the normal five-day work week we do here in America. Let's just calculate it. It's roughly $136 a day. So a person would go into the marketplace in today's culture, and they would be hired, and someone said, I need some people to help me bring in some hay, and I need some people to help me go on my fields, and I'm going to pour some concrete today, and I need this, and I need this, and I need this. And these people would gather in the area commons, and a work... A, a person would walk in and say, I need help pouring concrete today. I need four people that can handle that work. And four guys would say, I'll do it. He said, I'll pay you 125, 125, 125, 125. And they're like, sweet. And off they went. And they'd go work. That's how an employer got workers. And that's how workers got employment. And this is the dynamic that's taking place in that day. Well, they would show up very first thing in the morning when the sun was coming up because they wanted to work a full day and be paid for a full day, so they would show up. Well, in Jesus' story, something interesting happens. People showed up at 7 a.m., and they, some more showed up at 9 a.m., and then some showed up at 11, and 1 and 3, and then some knuckleheads showed up at 5 o'clock when it ended at 6. And the, the, the person's looking for more workers. He needs more workers, so he keeps going back, and he's like, where were you this morning? Oh, I slept in. I didn't feel like working. Well, I didn't feel like starving either, so I came to work. So they show up at one in the afternoon, and he's like, come on, I, I could use you. And, All right, so you agree to work. I'll take care of you. I will do what's right, it says. And that's the background of the story that Jesus tells. Now, some of you are saying why it's offensive. Trust me, I'll get you there in just a few moments if you'll stay with me. You see, each of the workers received an undeserved break. They were invited in on something that they didn't deserve to be a part of, and they would be taken care of if they participated. Keep that in mind. As I'm going to give you three points this morning, two are very simple, and one is where the offense takes place. The first is, because God is holy, God is just. Because God is holy, God is just. And I want to separate those two, and the reason I've written it this way is to make just a very simple theological point. Many of us think, because God is holy, that his justness is forced by us. That we make God do these hard things. He doesn't want to. He's just this big, warm, soft hug. No, no. His holiness requires that the right things have to be honored and the wrong things have to be punished. That's part of his holiness. It's not separate. It's not caused by us. I've used this illustration several years ago, and it's an old, old illustration. So if you're like under the age of 40, just Google it when I'm done. But when I was a kid... <laughs> it sounds even funnier now. When I was a kid, I had a curfew. That's not what I want you to Google, okay? But... <laughs> I had to go to bed at 8 o'clock, and I remember this distinctly. I know I went to bed at 8 o'clock because the Red Skelton show came on at 8 o'clock, and all I knew was this goofy guy would sit in this swing at the beginning of his show and tell stupid stories and joke, and I would have to go to bed at 8 o'clock. My older brother, Steve, who's five years older, got to stay up and watch that, and I would lay in bed being tortured because I could hear my dad and my brother laughing as hard as I've ever heard them laugh about anything their entire life, and I remember laying in bed hating them both. It was unfair. And I remember saying to my dad, it's unfair that Steve gets to stay up and I don't. And my dad went, you're right, go to bed. <laughs> That's how my father's justice played out. 
Do not mistake fairness for justice. Justice is the right thing. Fairness is what you think you deserve. And in this moment, my dad said, no, you're five years younger than your older brother. He deserves certain privileges. He got to stay up till nine o'clock and watch the entire show. I've actually gone online and seen the shows. Not that funny. <laughs> Maybe not funny in 2018. Maybe hilarious in the 70s. But I remember that going, oh, it was so unfair, so unfair. My dad's like, you misunderstand. There are things your older brother's always going to get to do that you'll never get to do. And my dad taught me a valuable lesson. Fairness is not in the equation, only in my head. Justice is what's right, and what's right for a 12-year-old is not right for a 7-year-old. And in those moments, I learned a valuable lesson. You see, in Psalm 33, about our God, it says, For the word of the Lord is upright, and his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. God is not perturbed to have to act justly. He can act no other way. Romans 3.23 then convicts us. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. All of us have told God to leave us alone, and there are consequences to that choice. All of us have told God we know better, and all of us have God told God we're going to do what we want anyway. There's not a person in this room, whether you're a believer in Jesus or you're just checking this thing out, all of us have the same conclusion. So if you come to church and you see a bunch of Christians, you think, I can never measure up to them. Oh, no, we're just like you. <laughs> the difference is we've been forgiven, and you haven't understood that enough to receive it. But all of us are broken, all of us are sinned, all of us live in an act of rebellion in our heart. And instead of that making us all feel equal, it should make us feel incomplete. We should understand this is not what we were created for, and we know that in our heart. Psalm 37, 28, For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. That's a huge term. If you ever want to do a Bible study, just look up what that term cut off means in Scripture all the way back in the Old Testament carried on. And it is the fact that God is warning us that there will be a moment we will be accountable for what we've chosen and we don't want to be accountable for what we've chosen. And so he offered us a solution. See, God is just. He will not be mocked and he will not be tricked. He will do the right thing because he is holy he is just. In fact, last week, if you were with us, when Jesus talked about his return that day, like lightning across the sky, that he will be back and it will be at that moment that the judgment of all time will take place as to what we did with his offer of mercy. He asked the question, will I find faith? Will I find people that have chosen to lean on me and my holiness or will I find people who have chosen me, have chosen to say to God, just leave me alone? So because he is God, and holy, he is just. Second thing, because God is gracious, God is not fair. Because God is gracious, God is not fair. So two boys were walking to school together, and one asked the other, what'd you bring for lunch? And Timmy replied, my mom made me broccoli sandwich. And his friend Craig went, oh, yuck, didn't she give you liver yesterday? And he said, yeah. Craig said to Tim, wow, she's not going to get over you pointing out that gray hair, is she? Deep down inside, all of us seem to think that God's getting even with us. If something doesn't go right, oh, God's punished me because I didn't do this and I didn't do this. Now listen to me carefully. Logically follow with me. If that is truly what God does, if God gets even with us for every little thing we do wrong, how come any of us are still here? There are those moments, God's not playing a game here. Where he's like, okay, I really kind of like you, but I don't like that dude at all. So that guy's going to get cancer, and this lady's going to just act like her life's perfect. No, God doesn't get even this way. He tells us that one day we're going to stand before him and be judged by whether or not we trusted him, or we're going to be expelled from his presence because we did not trust him. But God does not go through these days giving certain people illnesses and doing certain things. This is not the nature of God's heart. He has warned through the prophets, and there have been punishments. I love the passage in the Old Testament where some young kids made fun of a bald guy and a bear ate him. I think that's, I love that story. But that's the exception to the rule, not the promise. I thought I'd get an amen from some of my slick friends, but anyway. But the good news is that God doesn't get even. The good news is that God forgives. Church. The good news is not that God doesn't get even. The good news is that God forgives. He desires to make up the difference we can't make up. He desires for us to know we're sinners and respond to his grace and receive it. And that's flat unfair. 
See, what's unfair about it is we deserve punishment, don't we? One of the biggest awakenings for a believer is to admit, I deserve to be punished for my rebellion. And I'm not talking about the minor things, stub your toe in the middle of the night and say a bad word. Yeah, move that aside. I'm talking about the moments where you flat out knew what was right and you didn't do it. You, you knew you should have been generous and, and you should have taken care of a poor person or you, you should have forgiven somebody who needed forgiveness and those big ticket items and we just looked and said, nah, I don't trust that if I forgive, they'll actually have learned anything and God's like, you don't trust me. And God's not in heaven all offended by that. He's broken that his love hasn't convinced you that he has your best interests at heart. John Newton was a slave trader. He would go and take people from Africa, capture them against their will, bring them to England and other parts of the England, uh, English colonies, and he would sell them. Human beings, he sold them like they had no dignity and no made in the image of God, and he sold him as a slave trader, and then he found Jesus, and he was forgiven of his sins, but he was broken by what he'd done, and he became this master hymn writer. He wrote Amazing Grace. But one of the things he said that I love that wasn't written in music is this great quote. He said, when I get to heaven, I shall see three wonders there. The first will be to see people there I didn't expect to see. The second wonder will be to miss many people I expected to see there. And the third will be that I am there. He understood grace. That we think we have it all figured out. We think we know who's in. We think we know who's out. Do you know that Jesus told us that it is not our prerogative and we have no ability to decide who's going to make it and who's not? That totally lands on him. He's the only one who knows what he's talking about. We make good speculations. But the truth is, we don't know. Because we don't know the heart of a person. Only Jesus does. And John Newton said, my heart tells me I shouldn't get in, but Jesus tells me I will. And that's good news. And that doesn't offend us at all, right? So I began by saying, this will offend you. This will offend you. You're like, I'm not offended if I get into heaven. Sweet. But let's talk about what's really offensive. What if someone you don't think should be there gets there? And I know none of you think this way. But that person who's driving down range line in the left lane at 20 miles an hour? Do they deserve heaven? Depends on the day. Now, I'm, I'm being light about it, but I could go really serious on this and say, yeah, there's some people in your world who've done you bad. Now, I'm not talking about silly things like traffic or having 14 items in the 12 items at checkout at Walmart. There should be at least a day in hell for that, but there's not. But what about someone who's wronged your children? took your money, lied to you, betrayed you, divorced you, cheated on you. Yeah, see, it can go really good. Spin really deep. See, the offense of grace is that it's unfair. It's unfair that someone who went to work at six in the morning and worked 12 hours got paid $125. And someone who showed up at five o'clock and worked for one hour got paid $125. And you go, oh, no one would do that. Jesus does it every day. Deathbed confessions? Serial killers who were one to Christ in prison. None of the people that they killed or hurt are alive. Their families are still devastated. There's tragedy and scarring and hurt and pain and anguish. And yeah, the gospel is offensive because it's unfair. Because deep down inside, if we're not careful, we'll be like the Pharisees and the teachers that Jesus is telling this parable to. We believe that we should. I mean, let's be honest. If 90% of the people in heaven, we're going to be like, good for you. And the other 10%, we wish God would have allowed a vote. Because wait a second, you mean this guy lives like trash and hurts people and takes advantage of people and prospers his entire lifetime and five minutes before he dies, he confesses Jesus Christ is forgiven of his sins and he gets to be a part of the kingdom and we go, whoa, time out. That's what? Offensive. And brings me to Romans chapter three, verses 22 through 26. I'm going to read it out of the contemporary English translation because I think it'll be new and fresh. And I also like the way they interpret it. But listen to what we're all told here. God treats everyone alike. He accepts people only because they have faith in Jesus Christ. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But God treats us much better than we deserve. And because of Christ Jesus, he freely accepts us and sets us free from our sins. God sent Christ to be our sacrifice. Christ offered his life's blood so that by faith in him, we could come to God. 
And God did this to show that in the past he was right to be patient and forgive sinners. This also shows that God is right when he accepts people through faith in Jesus. You see, the truth is, the economy of God's grace is offensive to us because we'd like to have a say on how much someone actually has to do once they know who Jesus is to earn heaven. There is no earning of this new life with Christ. There is no earning the new kingdom. There is no earning the new king. There is nothing you can do. Bring your resume. It's garbage. Your best life after knowing Jesus gives you no more fee of admittance than the person who's done nothing their entire life. Now, the people who have the deathbed confessions, the people who wreck their lives and at the last minute show up an hour before it closes and gets the whole day's wages, we say, that's not fair, but please understand, if you believe the kingdom is alive today, what they missed out by living their life in the trash and the gutters and the filth, they did not get what you and I have. They did not get the peace and the joy and the promise of knowing God is faithful even when I'm not. The stresses of the life drive people who don't trust Jesus to do the worst things because they're always providing for themselves. And you and I can trust that we can be overtly generous knowing that God will never let us miss a single thing if we've done what's right for the kingdom. See, there is more to this life than just getting into heaven one day. There is living like heaven right now. And experiencing the joy and peace is a legacy. You see, the unfairness of God is seen at the cross. It's not seen by who gets into heaven. The unfairness of God is shown when his son took the just punishment I deserved and went to the cross as an innocent man and received what I deserved to be stripped naked and to beaten and broken and tortured and mocked and betrayed and all the things. And I deserve to be put on that cross and pay for my penalty alone and nobody would have felt bad for me. Everybody would have gone, that's a just sentence. But when Jesus did that, there was nothing just about it. It was unfair. But in God's perfect will, he decided that his justness could be shown through the unfair act of Jesus dying on the cross. So Jesus could say to Mark Christian, do you want to trade? Would you trade your broken existence for mine? And I decided yes. And no regrets. So maybe I'm a 9 a.m. person. I've had periods of time where I didn't show up at 7. I slept in. I showed up at 9 and he invited me as a 9-year-old. And I got serious about it when I was about 16. And I've started following him. Some of you in this room... You're 11 a.m. people, aren't you? And some of you are 1 p.m. I had a good friend of mine in the church show up to me afterwards. He goes, yeah, I'm a, I'm a one o'clocker. I like that term now, so we're all going to wear around our badges. Mark, 9 a.m.er. <laughs> and some of you, you're 5 p.m.ers, aren't you? You're like, man, I just lived my life, and I made a bunch of choices, and I ended up broken and bitter, and at the end of the day, I felt empty, and I knew there was something more, and preacher comes to me and he starts talking to me about this Jesus and I'm like if this is true I'd be a fool to turn it down it is true but the news the good news church is this and this is what my friend said to me this morning I want to give him credit he said but the 1 p.m.ers and the 3 p.m.ers and the 5 p.m.ers you guys need to understand your testimony may be more powerful than those of us who are the six and the nine Because you can talk about how you lived a life that didn't pay off, how you tried and tried and tried to find satisfaction, and then look what's happened in your world since you started following Jesus. Look at the joy. I don't care when you joined the work. You need to speak to people around you. It is not too late to show up. Because Jesus says when he closed the vineyard that day, he told the foreman, pay the people last who came at 5 o'clock, and they showed up. Now, imagine the room. This is what he wants us to think about. So the people that showed up at 5 o'clock, at 6.05, they're getting paid that night, and they get 125 bucks. They're like, sweet. The people behind them that showed up at 3 o'clock, what are they expecting? How about the 1 o'clock people? Wow, forget them. Let's go to the 6 a.m. people. They're like, dude, they got, wait, what? They got a whole day's wage for one hour's work? Cha-ching, I'm going to get 12 days' wages for my work today. And the owner says, no, no, you agreed to what? You agreed to 125, now we're going, no, you mean I could have gamed the system and only worked? No, no, stop being American. 
Understanding that that entire day you gave your labor, you found your purpose, you had a reason to exist, and you gave that good effort and labor, and you got paid what you agreed. You're not getting cheated. You're getting more than you deserved because he offered you a place in his vineyard. Are you with me, church? We have to stop thinking it like Americans and start thinking it about kingdom workers, thinking whether I joined at 6 a.m. or 5 p.m., I got to be a part of something that's going to matter for eternity. It's unfair. So was the cross, and so was his invitation to me. But I have no regrets. How about you? You see, God is holy, but he is just. And God is gracious, and that's unfair. The third and final point I want to make is, if grace when offered to others offends us, we have misunderstood the gift of righteousness offered to us. If there's someone in your world right now that you can't offer the invitation to come work in the vineyard, you've not understood grace. If there's someone you can't forgive or someone you can't overcome what they've done and how they live their life, if there's someone you've written off, I'm telling you, you've misunderstood grace. You see, this is the gotcha moment when he pays everybody the same. In Ephesians 2, 8, it says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith and this is not from yourself, it's the gift of God. In verse 13 of the text, Jesus is quoted as saying in his story that friend, Didn't you agree to work for Daenerys? Didn't you agree to give your life to me? Didn't you agree to trademark? Didn't you agree to trade your life for mine? Jesus offered me that. And I said, yes. Who am I then to decide who else he makes that offer to? Who am I to decide whether or not they're good enough to receive it? Who am I to stand and say, no, Jesus, what you offered me, I earned, but you can't give it to this person. They're a creep. Or they've taken advantage of people. You don't know the horrific things they've done. Jesus' response is, I do. Aren't I allowed to do with what I want with what is mine? Am I not allowed to give grace to whoever I want to give grace to? And we know the answer to that question, even though we don't always like it. Yeah, you have the right to do whatever you want because you are our God and you are my king. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through this poverty might become rich. God is the owner. Jesus is the foreman. And we are the workers. Or are we? There are people in the room today who have never thought for a second that they could come into this kingdom because what you've thought is, it's, it's five o'clock, I missed the window. Or it'd be so humiliating to show up there now and expect to receive anything. Stop. He's just, but he's gracious. And he's saying to a person today who's not following him in this room right now, you can tell me all you've done. I'm going to tell me, I can tell you what I'll do. I will forgive you. I will restore you. I will empower you. And I will lead you by the spirit. I will lead you into truth. I will change who you are. I will change your soul. I'll redeem all of it. It's today the day you receive that. Around this room are four tables with lamps lit on them. And there are some of our elders and staff at those tables right now. You look around this room and if you're a person here today saying, I've had a million reasons why I couldn't accept it. I have a million reasons why it'd be humiliating to say now after I made fun of this stuff and I I never thought it was real. If the Holy Spirit is saying to your heart today that Jesus Christ is real and he loves you and in his justness, he will receive your penalty and in his unfairness, he will bless you. If you want a part of that, then listen to the testimony of the rest of us who've received that. The difference between you and me is someone explained that to me and I said yes. And today someone's explaining it to you and you have yet to choose. Yes or no? If you'd like to make a decision to become a follower of Jesus, if you'd like to renew your commitment to following Jesus, that's what we're talking about today. The justice of God was displayed on the cross to Jesus. The unfairness of God was displayed to you and I when he offered us a chance to be a part of his work forever. And we agree, following Jesus is better than any life I've ever lived and greater than any choice I've ever made. It overcomes my sin, it gives me hope, and it gives me a story. No matter what time of day it is, one, three, or five in the afternoon, I can invite someone else to join me in the work because they will receive everything promised to me no matter how late they get in the game. That's my hope today. Church, is that good news? Because Jesus is offering each one of us a chance to be his by simply confessing who he is, confessing that we're sinners, 
and being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins to walk in newness of life. We would love to begin that process with any person here today who feels called to say, I want a part of Jesus' kingdom. No matter how late it is, I want to work. If that's you, go to one of these tables. We'll be happy to have a conversation to start this process with you. Let's stand together and sing.